Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about pipeline hazards. Now, in the last video, we brought up this concept of pipeline to replace our uh, single cycle processor. And remember, the idea here was that instead of executing an entire instruction in a single cycle, we were going to change the amount of work that we were going to do per cycle um, to just one stage of a pipeline, right? And the motivation behind that was that we could get better utilization out of our different um, uh, hardware structures, right? We could overlap the execution of uh, multiple different instructions um, at the same time so that while one you know, instruction was going to the fetch stage, another could be going to the decode stage, another can be doing some sort of execution in the ALU, another could be reading or writing something to memory, and then another could be, uh, say, writing something back into our register file, right? And this was the case for a five-stage pipeline. And we saw how this could lead to a, uh, a really good performance Im improvement compared to a single cycle processor. But we also said that um, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Right, So that despite the fact that there's all these positives around pipelining, we introduced some new problems. Now, specifically, one of the problems was around this thing called hazards, right? Um, suddenly, we don't have the same guarantees that we had with a single cycle processor. So uh, in a single cycle processor, we didn't really have to worry about dependencies. When we were executing uh, one instruction, we knew that all the previous instructions had already completed, right? Because we're completing an entire instruction every single cycle. Um, but this isn't the case um, for uh, uh, our pipeline processors, um, or at least in terms of the fact that um, we could have multiple instructions in flight at the same time. And there could be some sort of dependency between those uh, different instructions. So uh, some of the terminology that we're going to have here, or some of the, the way that we're going to represent things, we're going to represent uh, dependencies with these red arrows. So, uh, you know, the, the, the base of the arrow will be where the result is being generated, um, and the arrow is going to point to where it needs to be, right, or where it needs to be used. Um, now, specifically, when we're looking at these diagrams, um, arrows to the left, right, um, ones that are going kind of backwards, um, these are the ones that are bad, right? These are the dependencies that we have to watch out for. Um, basically, um, this is, you know, time travel, right? It's where we're generating a result right now, but we needed it in the past. So remember the, uh, the X axis here is basically just a timeline. So this is just time in, in picoseconds in this case. Uh, so right here, we're saying that, uh, a result that we're say writing back to a register file, um, inside of a write back stage was needed say uh, at the beginning of decode for these two instructions here, right? So we're updating say a value in a register uh, and then these two instructions want to read that value, right? So we run into an issue here uh, because our decode stage is happening much earlier in time uh, compared to when we're actually updating say that value in a register. Um, so how do we classify these hazards, right? Um, we said that there are hazards, but what types of hazards exist out there? And we can largely group them into these three major categories. So we have uh, structural hazards. So this is when multiple uh, instructions want to use the same hardware structure at the same time. Um, we have our data hazards, which is you know, you know similar to the situation we just talked about, uh, where an instruction depends on the result of another instruction. And then we have this third type of hazard called control hazards, or sometimes called branch hazards. So this is when we can't fetch the correct instruction in the right clock cycle. Uh, an example of this is after a branch, right? Um, you know, we're trying to do a fetch of an instruction um, every single cycle, uh, but this presents a problem, right? If we're jumping to a different part in our code, um, you know, if we're doing, say, a branch of equals, right? We have to do that equality comparison to figure out if we're just going to um, our program counter plus four or someplace else in our program, right? Based on, uh, you know, the, the offset that's provided inside of that instruction. So let's go ahead and start by talking about our structural hazards, right? That first type of hazard. So our structural hazards um, occur because two different instructions or multiple instructions want to use the same hardware component at the same time. Uh, so an example of this uh, would be if, say, we had a unified instruction and data memory. Uh, so remember, uh, we have this concept of a stored program computer. Uh, really, just all of our programs and all of our data, they're just bits stored in memory. So we don't really need two separate components for this. Everything can be in just one unified instruction plus data memory. Um, however, this could lead to somewhat of an issue, right? So 
Uh, for example, we might have one instruction that's doing fetch, right? It's trying to read its instruction from instruction memory. And then we have an, we might have an instruction that's say in the uh, the memory stage of our pipeline. So it's trying to maybe uh, read some data from memory or maybe write some data to memory. So we have both say a read and a write that are ha trying to occur at the same time. Um, and this could present an issue if we had say unified instruction plus data memory, right? We might not be able to do both a read and a write or say two reads in the same cycle. Right? So we might have to stall one of the uh, instructions. Now, a lot of this depends on the design of our actual hardware structures. Um, so for example, our register file, right? Um, with something like our register file, we might be able to handle both um, our decode stage, which is trying to read uh, register values or read values from our register file. Um, and it might be also be able to handle um, our write back stage, which is trying to write values into that exact same register file. So we may be able to support, say, uh, concurrent access into, say, a register file in the same cycle, right? Uh, so it really depends on the implementation of these hardware structures uh, in terms of what they're able to support. Okay, so moving on, uh, one of the most common types of hazards we have um, are these things called data hazards. Um, now, data ha hazards occur because an instruction uh, can depend on the results, say, of an earlier instruction. So we have a very simple example here to illustrate this. Uh, so for example, uh, I1, our instruction, will write uh, some value to x2, right? So we have an add instruction here, adding register x1 and x0, and storing that result in x2. But then our next instruction here, I2, is trying to read from x2. So, you know, I2 um, is write, uh, reading from x2 and x4, right? Those two registers, adding them together, um, and then trying to store that result in x3. So the dependency we have here is that I2 needs to wait for the write uh, to X2 that's happening in I1 to occur before it can continue, right? I2 needs to be able to see that most recent value. Uh, so remember, in a single cycle processor, this really isn't an issue here. Uh, because when uh, we execute I1, I1 is the only instruction being executed. But now we have this issue where we have I1 and I2 in flight in different stages of the pipeline at the same time. So we have to do this thing called stalling, right? We have to wait for I1 uh, to finish writing the result of X2 before um, uh, I2 here can read X2. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like a bit visually. So here we have uh, I1 here, right, which is trying to say uh, read that result of X2. So, uh, you know, we fetch that add instruction, we decode it, read the registers, we execute it, we get the result, right, of what X2 is going to be. Then we get to the memory stage, where we don't really do anything, we're not writing anything or reading anything to memory. And then finally, we get to the write back stage, right? And this is where we're updating that register file with the value. But I2 down here, so this is our add instruction that wants to consume X2, it wants to read that updated value. You know, it gets to its fetch stage in the next clock cycle after I1 does fetch, but it, it actually can't uh, complete its decode, right, until three cycles later. Or it can't even start it. And the reason is, is in decode, that's when we read our register file. And we can't start reading our register file until the result we want is in our register file, until we've actually written it there, right, in this last write back stage um, that I1 is going through. So we have these three stall cycles. And then we can see that if you put these dependency lines in there, uh, and then we say we have another instruction, um, I3, that also wants to read X2, right? We have one going straight down now to decode. Um, arrows straight down are perfectly okay. That just means that we have uh, a value that we just generated someplace and we want to use it someplace else. That's okay. There's no time travel going on there, right? We don't need some value in the past. And then over here, um, this is just saying, you know, when we have an error going forward into the right like this, this is saying some value we generated is needed somewhere else in the future. Perfectly okay. Um, but you can see the problem here when we have these kinds of dependencies, right? Um, you know, suddenly we're not getting the best utilization out of the pipeline. Um, our pipeline just has to stall and even our later instructions, right? They can't continue because I2 is stuck in the fetch stage. So I3 can't even begin the fetch stage until I2 can move past the fetch stage, right? Uh, so this is one of the issues that we have, right, with these data dependencies um, and these data hazards. Okay, now 
you know, it isn't the end of the world that we have data hazards. There's often ways that we can get around these hazards. And one of the ways is through this technique called forwarding or bypassing. So the idea behind this is that instead of waiting for, you know, our value to go all the way through the pipeline and say, go to the right backstage and update the register file, well, why don't we just add a little bit of extra hardware and just forward the value directly, right? So we're not updating the register file here, we're just forwarding the value back into, say, the execution unit. So in the case of, you know, dependent R type instructions here, so we're, where we have something like an add followed by another add, we can just take the output of the execution unit, the ALU, and feed it back as an input, right? So we can detect that um, we have this data hazard here. Um, and instead of trying to read from the uh, register file here, install on the decode stage, we can say, oh, well, we're just going to use the value that was just generated out of the execution unit. And you can see that we can get rid of all of those bubbles in this case, right? We don't have to wait for the memory stage and the write back stage before continuing on with decode, right? We can just continue without any bubbles. So this kind of forwarding or bypassing uh, can eliminate these stalls between R-type instructions. But that's not the only kind of dependency that we have um, between instructions. We can also have dependencies between um, our load instructions and these R-type instructions. So for example, we might be, say, um, reading a value that the next instruction wants to use. And then even with bypassing, we still have to stall here, right? So even if we try to, you know, forward something from our memory stage uh, to the beginning of our execution stage, you can see that we have an arrow going back into the left, right? It's going backwards, which means that, you know, some value that we're loading from memory was needed somewhere in the past. So in this case, right, we can avoid some of the stall cycles um, by doing bypassing like this. We can't say avoid all of the stall cycles, um, but it can still be very helpful, right? A lot of our solutions to these problems is to throw extra hardware at the problem, right? Add bypass logic, right, in order to forward values from one stage to another. Okay. So the last type of hazard that we're going to talk about today is this thing called control hazards. And this uh, is aptly named because it's about control flow. So it's about things like branches. So um, not every single instruction is four bytes away. So remember our instructions are 32 bits, which is four bytes. So in many cases, we're just incrementing our program counter by four, right? To, in to uh, index into the next instruction. But we have branches, right? We have our branch of equal instruction that we support inside of our architecture, right? And this uh, presents a problem, right? Because, you know, we're fetching an instruction every single cycle. But our branch, if equal instruction puts a, a, a little bit of a, a it puts some trouble into this because now we have to wait until we compare the results of two registers to know if we're going to say, you know, our PC plus four or PC plus, you know, some offset that's inside of this uh uh, this branch instruction, right? So what do we fix on the next uh, clock cycle? Now, just like with our data hazard, um, what we could just do as a simple solution to this is just stall. So just wait for the branch result to be known and then continue from that point. Uh, but of course, this is going to be bad for performance, right? Um, you know, we don't want to be just stalling our, proce our processor all over the place. Um, we want to keep our pipeline as filled as possible at all times, right? Executing these instru instructions and getting the max throughput of instructions that we can. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like, right? Uh, so um, if we don't know, uh, say, what our uh, uh, instruction is going to be, right, uh, the next one, we can just wait until after the execution stage, right? Because after that stage, we will have compared the values, uh, we know which direction our branch is going, right? We know if it's going to PC plus four or PC plus an offset. And then after two cycles, right, so after we stall for decode and execute, we can begin our fetch for our next instruction, which is either PC plus four uh, or PC plus whatever our offset is. Now, just as a bit of a caveat here, um, you know, you could bring up the question of, can we check our branch outcomes earlier? And the answer is yes, we could be a little bit clever here. And instead of having all of our work being done by our execution stage, we might be able to move some of that hardware um, into our decode stage, right? So our decode stage, we've read the registers. Um, 
we have the immediate value, uh, we might be able to check uh, to see the direction of a branch here. So we might not stall for two cycles here, we might only stall for one if we move some of that hardware specifically for branch instructions to the decode stage, right, uh, and avoid at least one of these stalls. Uh, so that's one thing that we could do. But with our uh, kind of uh, baseline architecture that we've been looking at, we would have to stall for at least two cycles here, right, if we took the stalling approach. Now, of course, there's there's always workarounds, right, for a lot of these things. And uh, the main workaround for things like control hazards is uh, this thing called branch prediction, right, uh, which is sometimes which falls into this category of optimizations called speculative execution, right? We don't know exactly which instruction we should be executing, but we're going to take a guess. And if we end up being right, well, then we had no penalty, right, for having a branch there. Um, the caveat to this, of course, is that if we're wrong, uh, we're going to have to be able to flush that state. So we have to be able to recover from uh, bad predictions. So if we're able to correctly predict our branches, so for example, if we predict that, you know, we're just going to the next instruction, so PC plus four, we can keep our pipeline fully filled and not have any bubbles in here. Now, um, you know, what we can do as a simple strategy, right, for our design is we can just always predict, say, not taken, right? That'd be a very simple approach. It's not a great approach, right? It's assuming that most of the time your branches are not taken, which, um, in, in fact, is oftentimes not the case, especially for things like loops. You can imagine a loop, you're almost always taking the branch. So not, not necessarily a great um uh, prediction scheme, but it is a prediction scheme that can help if you do have a branch that's not taken here. So in the case where we're predicting always not taken, um, we have absolutely no penalty for having a branch, right? We, for, we fetch the correct instruction in the next cycle, right? So this is our logic for just doing PC plus four. So from the fetch stage, right, of I1, we can, in a single cycle, just add the current uh, PC and four together, and feed that in as our next PC, right? So we have absolutely zero stalls in this case. Um, however, if we uh, are incorrect, right, and the branch actually is taken, well, we don't really have any extra penalty here. We do have to do some cleanup of the extra state, but that, that won't stall our pipeline anymore, um, at least with uh, in ways that we can implement it. Uh, what we end up happening, what ends up happening is just we have the exact same penalty as if we had no branch prediction in the first place, right? Uh, we would still just have that two cycle penalty or one cycle um, if we happen to move that logic to the uh, decode stage, right? Um, so these are just some ways that we can get around these control hazards. Control hazards are much more difficult to get around typically than our uh, data hazards. Data hazards is all about just um, adding hardware to do things like forwarding. Uh, these control hazards get you into this realm of speculative execution and trying to make really good guesses about the outcome of branches. So it can be much more difficult and is certainly a topic that we're going to study much more in depth in uh, later videos when we cover you know, more advanced computer architecture. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. It's a brief introduction to the hazards that we see as a result of pipelining. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.